You maybe looked at the bulletin today and saw what this Sunday is and saw that it's Judgment Day. Sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? Judgment Day? I mean, who wants to be judged? Actually, when I was a little kid, I remember looking at the lectionary and the hymnal and I saw Judgment Day. And I asked my pastor, so are we supposed to come to church on Judgment Day when Jesus comes back for this service? I, it, it was a bit scary to me. Right? When, when, when we think of judgment, we think of getting in trouble. Right? As I ask the children, when they hear that word judgment, they think, oh no, I'm going to go to the office or I'm going to have to explain what I did and I might be judged. And there is good reason for that. When we hear the word judgment today, whether in a church setting or just thinking of our criminal system, our judicial system, judgment means you, know, you are guilty. If I describe someone as judgmental, Right, that, 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 that's not a good thing. In fact, I bet if you talk to someone who used to go to a church but doesn't really go any longer and ask them why, I guarantee you that's going to be one of the first words that comes to mind. Christians are just too judgmental. Not accepting. But is that how we as Christians view Judgment Day? When we hear the word of God in, in the Bible, when we get to know his mind, when we look at the history of God's people, something that you realize is that as Christians, as people who have faith in our Savior and judge, it's actually something that we look forward to. When we view God's judgment day, we think, come, come Lord Jesus. When you look at God's people, how they've talked about judgment throughout the history of mankind, it's not getting in the trouble, but, but actually judgment means getting out of trouble. When you are judged, that means God is in your favor. Your enemies are the ones who are condemned, not you. Let me share with you some, some, some episodes from the Bible where we hear of God making Judgment, And this judgment means salvation. This judgment means hope. This judgment is their freedom. Because God is merciful and he is fair. For example, when God's people were slaves in Egypt, and they were crying out to the Lord for, for literal freedom, this is what the Lord told Moses to, to say to the people. He said, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you to be my own people, and I will be your God. Judgment meant freedom. Judgment meant escaping Egypt and going to that promised land. There's a book of the Bible. It's called Judges. And in this book of the Bible, there's this cycle again and again and again where Whenever God's people forget who he is, they serve other gods, and because of that, they do what is wrong, they become enslaved, and, 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 and when they cry out to the Lord for help at that time, God would raise a judge for them. This judge would save them, at, at least for a time. At the beginning, Judges chapter 2 explains the situation well. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for Israel, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For millennia, God's people have prayed the words of Psalm 98, which read, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. And this is how it ends. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people's with equity. In 2 Peter, when he's encouraging Christians who are being killed for their faith, who are being persecuted, knocked out of their homelands, 
he describes how Noah was saved and how Lot, who you might call the unlikely saint, was saved. And he tells him this, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. As we heard last week, Martin Luther was put on trial before a judge of sorts. He stood before Emperor Charles V, one of the most powerful people in the world at that day. And he took his stand on God's word, on the word of our eternal judge, who is going to get that last word. He put his hope in salvation and said, God, help me. And that brings us to today, right? Today in 2015, for today's Judgment Day Sunday. A time for us to think, what kind of persecution, what kind of rejection are our brothers and sisters around the world facing? What kind of trials are we going through? What systems today are making us slaves? What are the things that, that, that we wake up and we just hope for peace and justice and we pray to the Lord that he would make things right? What are the things that make us yearn for Jesus to return and to, to, to put things right? From knowing many of you, I, I know many stories, people abroad who are preaching the faith you know, are literally being put in prison or beaten. In this city, there are many people we talk to who don't want to hear anything about Jesus. They don't want to hear anything about a church. The list could go on. We, we, we yearn for judgment, don't we? We want God to act. The letter to Revelation was written to a church that was undergoing this, this type of persecution. At that time, it was under the Roman Empire. And this is what the Lord had to say. He said, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. If you're like me, maybe you heard that part, uh, he's going to give to each person according to, the, to what they have done, and it made you pause for a little bit. As a good Lutheran, we know that God demands perfect righteousness, and so we look at ourselves and say, well, if God gives me according to what I've done, I know what that punishment is. If the wages of sin is death, I don't know if I want him to return. But Jesus is talking to us as saints. Jesus is talking to us as the people of God. Think about this. If you have been baptized with Christ, if he has washed away your sins in baptism, if you are his own son or daughter, his own heir to that eternal life, what is it that you have done in the eyes of our judge? If you are someone who tastes that the Lord is good in the Lord's Supper and receive his body and blood, what is it that you have done? If you come to worship and you confess your sins and with a repentant heart you hear those words of forgiveness, that Christ is our atoning sacrifice, that is, he has made God and us at one with each other, what is it really that we have done? In the eyes of both our Savior and our judge, we have done nothing wrong. And we have done everything right. Because when God sees us and when God comes back, comes back, he will see us as saints, as people who have been washed. One of our favorite words as Lutherans is justified. God already told us that we're not guilty. When he comes again on judgment day, it's just going to be a formal hearing in a sense. We already know what his verdict is going to be. Not guilty. And in fact, more than that, Jesus says he has a reward with him. He doesn't say, my punishment is not with me, but he actually says he has rewards to give us. And as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, Jesus gets the last word. 
no one else is going to give a judgment after. In the following verse, Jesus reminds us of, of, of a crucial truth. He says, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. If you have the chance to, to look at the book of Revelation during this week, read these chapters before as God describes in this beautiful poetic vision the city he has prepared for us, this new Jerusalem that's coming down with the tree of life, that tree that Adam and Eve were supposed to eat and, and to, to have that eternal life. God says he's going to give us that. He says we have the right. This is the same word used for an heir. When someone has a share and an inheritance, they have the right to that property. God tells us that as people who have been washed, we have the right to eternal life. We have the right to that city. And he tells us that it's coming. I mean, when we hear promises like these, what else can you say but come? <laughs> In the words of Revelation, as the bride of Christ, as us who are married to Christ, as people who have the spirit and, and, and think like God, there's no other words that we really have, are there? Come, yes. Come, Lord Jesus, make this happen. And that is how John continues. He says, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. It's free. It's there. Now, it is true that there are people who reject this gift. Right? There are people who want the world to continue the way it is. There are people who don't care for what they need to be saved from. There are people who don't want to think about how their actions affect other people. And of course, it's not just other people. There is that part of ourself, which when things are going well, we ignore the needs of others. There's, there, there's that part of us that likes parts of the Bible that talk about peace and joy and loving your neighbor, but we might want to cut out those parts of the Bible that are a bit controversial. Jesus does give us a warning. He he says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of the scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in that scroll. And if anyone takes away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. I asked this earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask it again. Do you remember how the Bible ends? I think if you ask most people who go to church, what are the first words of the Bible? They're going to say, yes, in the beginning, God created. Makes sense, right? How does the Bible end? Does it say, in the end? Done? Are there big letters, E-N-D? Maybe F-I-N? During this week, I, I would encourage you to always think of these words of the end of the Bible when you are yearning for justice, when you want peace, when you have been wrong, when you feel that you don't have the power to fix things. Hear the words of Jesus in the Bible. Hear what are literally the last words of Jesus and what is going to be the last word when he returns. Jesus says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. And to that, I say, Amen. <laughs>